Welcome to the flock. In this lab lesson, we're going to be performing a single replacement reaction where iron from an iron nail will be replaced by copper from a copper chloride solution. And then we will perform some lab calculations on that experiment. Stay tuned to see how you can figure out whether iron two chloride or iron three chloride forms as one of the products from this single replacement reaction and to see how much copper product we could yield from this reaction. In order to see if we form iron two chloride or iron three chloride, when an iron nail is reacted with copper chloride solution, we're gonna need to measure out 25 milliliters of this one molar copper chloride solution that we made in the previous video of Solutions and Dilutions Lab. Using a graduated cylinder, make sure you get down at eye level so that you can measure from the meniscus the 25 milliliters you need for this experiment to occur. Perfect. Now notice that I am wearing goggles and gloves for this experiment because we don't want to get copper chloride on our skin or in our eyes. Likewise, we're using one molar HCl hydrochloric acid, which we also don't want in our eyeballs or on our skin. Now let's pour this 25 milliliters of our copper chloride solution into our reaction vessel. Notice that everything I have here on my table setup is labeled. My iron and copper chloride beaker is even labeled as my reaction beaker. The next thing we want to do is prep a nail. So we're going to take an iron nail and some sandpaper and just kind of sand off the exterior of the nail so we can really expose all of those iron atoms for the reaction to occur. So just sand it down a little bit till the nail is nice and shiny, till any imperfections on the outside are removed with the sandpaper. Now that's a good looking nail right there. Before we put this iron nail into our copper chloride solution, we need to find the initial mass of the nail. So go ahead and put your nail on a scale and figure out what its initial mass is. Ah uh, yes, a whopping 0.6 grams. Now we can take this nail and plop it in our 25 mils of copper chloride solution. Plop. We're gonna let this nail sit in the solution for 25 minutes. In order to pass the time a little faster, I already did this with a previous experiment and it only has about four minutes left to go. Check out the differences in the color of these two solutions. Initially, the copper chloride is a very blue kind of aquamarine color. And after about 20 minutes of this other nail sitting in the copper chloride solution, we see that it's more of a greenish color, like a greenish blue. And almost immediately, you can see that the nail has changed from a nice shiny naily color which we'd expect for like an iron nail to be nice, shiny, and bright, to where it's almost immediately changed to this dark, rusty color. So as you're watching this reaction occur right now, there are literally copper ions getting pulled out of the copper solution and plating onto the nail. So what you're actually seeing form on the nail surface and dropping off of the nail is copper. So in addition to figuring out whether iron two chloride or iron three chloride solution forms, we also want to figure out how much copper can we make from this reaction. So we're going to be collecting that copper that's plating off of the nail and massing it to see how much we get. In order to collect that copper product, we're going to need to decant, which means we're going to pour off the liquid and leave behind the solid, and also filter in order to make sure we don't lose any of our product. Make sure you have a filter paper with the label on it. Notice that everything I use in my lab setup is always labeled. It's important to label, especially if you're working in a lab setting with other lab participants, because it's really easy to mix up two different people's beakers. So in the meantime, let's weigh our filter paper that we're going to collect our copper product on. And we've got it, a whopping 1.3 grams. 
Fun side story here, when I worked at the University of Arizona, I would frequently walk around and see if my students did not label their containers. And if they didn't, I would just conveniently swap their containers with groups that were working side by side. And that would mess up their entire experiment. Needless to say, they learned very quickly that in my lab class, you label everything, always. You gotta get your kicks in life somehow. We're gonna take the nail out of this first reaction vessel and find its mass along with how much copper we've made. Just take a look at the difference in the color and how much copper has played it out at the bottom of this beaker. Also remember that color change is an indicator for a chemical change. So we know that in this reaction, the solution goes from this blue color to this nasty green color. We know that there must have been a chemical reaction that occurred. Using some tweezers or tongs, if you happen to have any, we're going to pull out our nail and scrape off what we can from the sides so that it stays in the solution. We want to get all of the product off this nail as much as possible. Notice how much product is still left on the outside of this nail. We don't want to waste any of that. We want to make sure that we can get as much of it into our solution or onto our product paper. So I'm just gonna scrape off as much of this as I can onto my weighed filter paper. You're inevitably going to lose some product here, but that's okay. We can talk about that in the error analysis. Now that we've removed as much product as we possibly can, we're gonna set this nail aside and let it dry overnight before we take its final mass. The next thing we need to do is a process called decanting. And decanting just means that you're going to be pouring off this liquid solution into another waste container, leaving all the solid copper that's formed on the bottom behind. So we're going to try and transfer as much of the liquid as we can without removing the solid from our reaction vessel. So very carefully, you're going to want to pour off this liquid, this solution, which is going to be either our iron two or iron three chloride solution. We'll find out after some calculations. Notice that I don't have any solid copper in this decanted waste beaker. I'm trying to leave all of my solid in here. Now that we have this nice accumulated copper at the bottom of our reaction vessel, we want to wash this copper before we put it onto our filter paper. Using deionized water, we want to pour about 15 milliliters of that over the top of our copper that's still inside the reaction vessel. This isn't an exact science, I'm just going to pour in about 15 milliliters. Give it a nice little swirl to give it a good little wash. After the wash, you can see that the solution, the DI water, is slightly green because there's still some of that iron two or iron three chloride trapped amongst all of the copper solid. That's the reason why we're washing it. We don't want iron two or iron three chloride in our final product mass. Then of course you have to decant off the wash again. Make sure that you leave behind your solid in the original beaker. We don't want any solid product going into our waste container. Next, we're going to want to wash our copper, our solid copper product, with about 10 milliliters of one molar HCl. Again, not an exact science. I'm just going to be measuring about 10 milliliters into our reaction vessel. To give it a nice little wash here. It'll react with any other remaining chemical in there to really clean off the metal copper. Hopefully removing any other chemical residue. Now our copper is looking a lot more familiar just like our shiny copper pennies. Look at that beautiful copper product. Now let's decant off the HCl into the same waste beaker we've been decanting this whole time. <laughs> 
lastly, we'll wash it one more time with about 10 or 15 milliliters of deionized water. Give it a nice little swirl. And we'll have clean copper to work with. When you decant, it's okay if there's a little bit of liquid left in the bottom, so long as you haven't lost any of your solid product. The reason this is okay is because we're going to put it on the filter paper anyways and let it dry. I'm gonna add just a little bit of water to help remove our copper product from the bottom and get it onto our filter paper. Almost. I see a few little drops left inside the beaker that I want to get out. I'm just going to put that over here and hope that, that gets all of our copper out. There we go. Now that all of our product is on the filter paper, we just have to wait for it to dry now. Once it's dry, we'll take its final mass along with the final mass of the nail that was in the reaction vessel and do our calculations with those values. So let's wait 24 hours for this to dry and we'll mass it so we can do the calculations. It's been 24 hours. Let's see what the final mass of our nail and the copper product ends up being. Final mass of our nail is 0 0.5, and initially it was 0 0.6, so we lost 0 0.1 grams of iron to the solution. All right, how about the mass of our final copper product? And it appears that our final product weighs 1.6 grams. So remember, the overall goal for this experiment was to determine whether iron 2 chloride formed, that was that green solution after the nail reacted with the copper chloride, or whether that green solution was iron 3 chloride. There's just a difference of charge on the iron. In order to figure out if that green solution was the iron 2 or the iron 3, we need to do some calculations. Let's start with mole ratios. Looking at the balanced chemical equation, if it happened to be iron 2 chloride, we notice that there's one mole for each of these. So the mole ratio throughout this first equation is one to one to one to one. We're going to look at the mole ratio for how much iron we start with versus how much copper we end up with. So let's say we have one mole of iron to start, and if the solution is iron 2 chloride, we should have one mole of copper that forms. In other words, if iron 2 chloride is in fact that green solution, we should have a 1 to 1 mole ratio, or a value of 1. However, if we formed iron 3 chloride, let's check out what the mole ratio would be of iron to copper in that situation. We see that we have two moles of iron for every three moles of copper. So in this case, if that green solution is in fact iron three chloride, we would have a two mole of iron to three moles of copper ratio. In other words, we would have a value that's closer to two thirds instead of one. So then ultimately, we need to figure out how many moles of iron and how many moles of copper were actually in the experiment. To do so, let's figure out how much iron actually left the nail into the solution. So the initial mass of our nail when we weighed it on the scale turned out to be 0.6 grams. And our final mass of the nail ended up being 0.5 grams. Subtract those two, we end up with 0.1 grams of iron that got lost to the solution. It ionized. In other words, it went from a solid to an ion in solution, something dissolved in solution. So now all we have to do is take this grams of iron that actually went into the reaction and convert that to the number of moles of iron that's now in the solution. This sounds like a job for the magical line to freedom. To convert from grams of iron to moles of iron, all we need is the molar mass of iron, which is located on the periodic table. All we have to do is take 0 0.1 times 1 divided by 55.845 and we get 0 0.0018 moles of iron that's in the solution. 
In the experiment, before we put any product on our filter paper, we found that it had a mass of 1.3 grams. And then after it dried for 24 hours with our copper product on it, we found that it weighed 1.6 grams. That means that the mass of the copper we collected in the lab, the actual amount was 0.3, just from subtracting those two values. So of course we need to find the moles of copper that actually formed from this reaction in order to determine whether iron 2 chloride or iron 3 chloride was the green solution at the end. So we're gonna take this mass and use our magical line to freedom format to turn it into moles of copper. And there you have it folks. 0.0047 moles of copper is what formed from this experiment. Recall from the balanced chemical equations that if that green solution was iron 2 chloride, we should end up with a mole ratio of 1 mole of iron to 1 mole of copper. However, if that green solution was iron 3 chloride, we should end up with a mole ratio of 2 moles of iron to 3 moles of copper. In other words, if it was iron 3 chloride, our value should be something like 0.6667, and if it was iron 2 chloride, our value should be somewhere close to 1. So then all we have to do is take the mole values that we just found of iron and copper and divide those two numbers and see whether it's closer to 1 or closer to 0.6667. From our earlier calculations, we found that we had 0.0018 moles of iron in the solution that reacted, and 0.0047 moles of copper that formed. So let's just take those two mole values and divide them. 0.0018 moles divided by 0.0047 moles. And our final mole ratio answer is 0.383. Hmm, well that answer isn't really either of those two, but it is closest to that one. So we could say then that since it's closest to that one, experimentally speaking, just from doing this experiment once, of course, if you wanted to be more thorough, you would do this much more than just one time to be sure. But for now, the data indicates that iron three chloride is in fact the solution that formed from this chemical reaction. If your mole ratio value ends up closer to a value of one, then you would have to argue that you have iron two chloride solution that formed and not iron three chloride. All right, so technically our overall goal is answered at this point. We've determined that iron three chloride was the greenish solution that formed, and we found out that 0.3 grams was the amount of copper we made. But we want to have a percent yield of the copper product, not just the gram amount that we made. In order to do so, we need to calculate the theoretical yield. How much copper should we have made in a perfect world? We have the actual value. We actually got 0.3 grams of copper from the lab experiment. That's our actual yield here but we need to use our magical line to freedom format to determine how much we should have made in a perfect world scenario. In order to do this magical line to freedom format math, we need to use our lab values. How much iron did we start with? Well, we know that our nail weighed 0.6 grams and at the end it weighed 0.5 grams. So we know that the amount of nail or the amount of iron that actually reacted was 0.1 grams. So 0.1 grams is what we're gonna start with here. If we had 0.1 grams of iron that reacted with our copper chloride solution, how many grams of copper could we actually make? This is the typical format of molar mass, mole ratio, molar mass. Go ahead and pause the video here and see if you can figure it out before I show you the answer. Let's check your math. All right, so in a perfect world scenario, we should have created no more than 0.1707 grams of copper. So that would be our theoretical yield. In order to calculate the percent yield then, we need to take the actual amount that we formed, 0.3 grams, and divide it by the theoretical yield, the 0.1707. Hopefully you can see where this is going already. We produced way more than what was actually physically possible to produce. 
So let's divide these two numbers and then multiply by 100 to figure out the percent yield. And I end up with a whopping 175% yield. Now you might be thinking, pat myself on the back. I did way better than just 100%. That's like bonus points on the test, right? No, that's the wrong answer. To get over 100% in this case is a bad thing. That means I have some kind of contaminant in my product that isn't actually copper. Because theoretically, the maximum I could produce is 0.1707 grams of copper. Like literally, that's the absolute max that I should be able to make ever. And I made 0.3. That means that all of that extra to get to 0.3 is contaminant. Knowing that I have that much contaminant in my product means that my percent error is likely going to be high, but let's calculate it anyhow. We need to take our theoretical value that we just calculated, which was our 0.1707 and minus the experimental value that was 0.3 divided by the theoretical value again, 0.1707 absolute value thereof because we're not going to care about negative values here and then multiply all of that by 100 and we end up with a percent error of 76 percent in other words i was 76 percent wrong and only 24 percent correct not the best lab results of course, in science, you need to do experiments more than just once, as was demonstrated in this video. You need to do them many, many, many times. It's unlikely that science will ever work right the first time. It's quite rare. So in order to better this percent error value, I would need to do this experiment 10, 12, 20, 50 times until I can actually get some real trackable data and then also make sure that the green solution that formed was actually iron three chloride. If it was iron two chloride instead, all of my calculations would be different. To wrap up this lab, I'd like to discuss the difference between an error and a mistake. This is something I often saw that was confusing to my students in the classroom when writing a lab report. So in any lab, in any experiment ever, there's always going to be some degree of error, something that you can't control. So for example, we could say that if the yield was lower than what we anticipated, maybe the argument for that, or the error analysis argument for that, would be that the copper chloride solution wasn't able to fully react with the iron nail to produce the maximum yield. So maybe 25 minutes wasn't long enough to allow the maximum amount of iron to react. Or perhaps the calculation we did didn't include all of the iron that actually reacted from the scale measurement we wrote down. Or if the percent yield was higher than we expected, like mine was at 175%, I <sighs> chihuahua, then the copper we extracted maybe was still contaminated with HCl. Maybe we needed more HCl washes to fully remove other chemical contaminants. Maybe it wasn't dried all the way. Maybe there was still water molecules bound up inside of the filter paper. Maybe 24 hours isn't long enough for it to fully dry. Those are examples of errors. However, mistakes are not errors. Those two things are not equivalent. A mistake is something that can be corrected if you just simply did it right. So these are examples of actual things I've seen students write in their lab reports. Saying that you recorded values incorrectly, that's poor lab technique and poor studentmanship, if you will. That's not an error in the lab's part, that's just a mistake. If you didn't read the thermometer correctly, again, that's just poor lab technique and just carelessness on the behalf of the student, not a lab error. Or I did the calculations wrong, again, a mistake definitely not a lab error. So when you're discussing error analysis in terms of the lab, you need to think chemically. What happened on the molecular level? What happened amongst the chemicals? Where did the product go? What reactants reacted? What contaminants are present or could still be present? That's what you wanna focus on when you talk about error analysis. In this lab lesson, we performed a single replacement reaction where we took an iron nail and mixed it with copper chloride in order to extract copper 
from the copper chloride solution and replace it with iron from the nail into the solution. We determined that instead of iron 2 chloride, iron 3 chloride was actually the green solution that formed in the beaker after the reaction was complete. By using mole ratios as our justification for determining that it is iron 3 chloride after all. We then calculated for the percent yield of the copper that we actually got from the lab experiment by dividing the actual and theoretical values and found that we were grossly over 100%, indicating that we had quite a bit of error. In fact, our error was, in fact, 76%. That's a lot of error. And then we discussed the differences between errors and mistakes when you're writing your lab report in the error analysis section. Please give this video a quacks cool up, and when you're down on your luck in chemistry, subscribe to The Duck. Quack you later. No ducks, no glory.